We are so honoured to have with us today Mr Edwin Tong, SC, Singapore's Minister for Culture, Community and Youth and Second Minister for Law. Minister Tong will be participating in the session with Mr Daraz Gambata, member of the SIAC Court of Arbitration. So I see the stage is set and may I please invite Minister Edwin Tong and Mr. Daraz Kambata onto the stage, please. Good afternoon, Minister Tong, Justice Call, Davinder Singh, Gloria, Kevin, Rajiv, Shweta, and all of you. I think it's so important that Minister Tong is coming today to India because as You've been told by Justice Call and preceding speakers, today is an exceptionally important day, I would say in the history of modern post-independent India. Because it's the day on which in 1949, our constituent assembly adopted the constitution of India. And that is a remarkable document, as most of you know. If there is an idea of India, it is certainly reposed in our constitution which is really one of the great constitutions of the world. It's the document that has given us rule of law, democracy, a bill of rights, and which creates the entire ecosystem for the remarkable growth that India has shown in the last two or three decades. Without the constitution, none of this would be here. It is appropriate that Minister Tong, who comes from our profession, is therefore here today. And let me say a bit about him. He was, of course, an extremely successful senior counsel. He worked with Allen and Gledhill, as you know, one of Singapore's leading and an internationally leading law firm. Uh, he is today second minister for law, minister for culture. And before that, he also was a minister for health during the first few months of the pandemic. And he was therefore in the vanguard of Singapore's response uh, to COVID and all that it brought with it. Today, however, he is in charge of a spectacular story, which is the growth of Singapore. Gro Singapore has always been, of course, a great center for services. But I think we have seen again in the last three decades, uh, the growth of Singapore into a center for legal services, for dispute resolution, not only arbitration, but now also mediation, uh, and of course, international commercial courts. Uh, so it's, we are very fortunate to have him here. Uh, we've already heard about the deep relationship that SIAC has with Singapore. Uh, and Really, Singapore is, complements the great growth story that India has undertaken and will continue to undertake in the years to come. Uh, but I want to start on a more personal note with you, sir. Uh, you've worn several hats over the last few years, and you've, of course, been a practitioner. If I could ask you a personal question, what prompted you to move from such a successful private practice into public service? Thank you, Darius. I think the short answer is a little bit like what Justice Sanjay said earlier. There was a little bit of force as well involved in that. I, I spent many years as a private practitioner. I spent close to uh, 25 years at Ellen and Gladhill. So I was first elected in 2011. And at that time, you know, our system, you can be a backbencher. And a backbencher means that you serve as a member of parliament, looking after your constituency, but at the same time holding on to your full-time job. So some of us uh, carry on as a backbench for a number of years. So in that capacity, I, was, I remained a lawyer in practice for some years. And then sometime in uh, 2016, 2017, I was asked to step up and take a place in the government. I was initially quite reluctant. I enjoyed practice. I enjoyed being with the bar, I think interacting. And I was in India many times in that capacity with SIAC. With, uh, with my firm, you know, meeting with many of you here. And I, I'm very glad, you know, in some ways, that this occasion has given me a chance to reconnect with old friends as well. But I enjoyed all of that, and I had built up a practice. 
so I found it difficult, to be honest. But eventually I was persuaded that there was a lot more that we could do and that we could play a part in influencing legal policy, legal industry in a, in a broader way. And um, so I felt at some stage ready to take that plunge and so I did so in 2018. So here I am. And, and but, thank, thankfully for us, here you are. Yeah, yeah. But, but before we, we go further, I want to just say thank you very much for having us here on this day. You know, we didn't quite realize how important this day was going to be. And in fact, it was a combination of different people's schedules, you know, mainly myself, that resulted in this occasion being on today. So we're very fortunate that we are here with you on such a happy occasion, a historic occasion as well. But at the same time, also very mindful of how much we have intruded upon your own time, you know, attending the many functions. Rajiv was just showing me his long list of schedules, and I think uh, it, it struck us that, you know, we are really here and are very honored that all of you are here attending this occasion with SIAC. So it's, it's interesting for us to know a little about how Singapore uh, dealt with COVID, particularly in the early months when you were in charge. So could, could you give us a little bit of a, a sort of a bird's eye view into what Singapore's responses were? Sure. I, so as, as you said, Darius, I, I was at the Ministry of Health um, at the end of 2019, December. In fact, I remember this very well because I think the, my last visit to Delhi was in 2019. And I remember that in late December 2019, we were getting reports of, unconfirmed reports of some mysterious virus and there were some studies that were undertaken and we weren't sure. And of course, we know what that eventually became. So fast forward to sometime in early 2020, we were facing with the virus full-fledged and uh, we had to deal with it from a number of fronts. And the two most important ones were, of course, to make sure that people remain safe from a public health perspective. We weren't sure at that point in time what we were dealing with. We weren't sure how lethal, how difficult it'll be, how contagious it will be, whether it would have uh, consequences you know, on a longer term basis and so on. So almost like every other country in the world, we decided that we had to shut down. So we called it a circuit breaker to make sure that you know, we you know, work from home, businesses were stopped, uh, we couldn't move out, travel of course was curtailed and so on. So from a lives perspective, saving lives, ensuring public health, that was important. We also looked at vaccination. Uh, I remember very early on we were talking about what, what we did with vaccinations and of course in its very early nascent stages, no one was sure whether there would be a vaccine and by who this vaccine could be produced. So we sent our people overseas, studied the system, studied the research that was being done and I remember we, we placed certain bets you know, on some people and we looked at the contracts that we had to sign you know, between ourselves as a government and the pharmaceutical com companies and we looked at those very closely. But at that point in time, it was, you know, you had to take it or leave it, right? So we had to essentially put our faith in some of the vaccines, which thankfully worked out well. But the other impact of, uh, and, and, and coming to, to my um, Ministry of Law had as well, the other impact of closing the economy, of course, is in people's livelihoods, to make sure that livelihoods can be retained. And, you know, no business is equipped for zero cash flow, for a, even for a limited, you know, two, three week period, let alone one that was going to stretch out like this. So we looked at how we could ensure that livelihoods could be, could be preserved. And so we introduced a number of different measures which were quite unprecedented, have been quite un unprecedented. I mean, like India, we are a common law country that's very, uh, the foundation of our legal system would be party autonomy and the sanctity of contract. But we felt as a government that we had to intervene in pretty sharp ways. So we started, I remember in April 2020, we, we passed a law very quickly to impose a moratorium. No one could bring a claim for breach of contract arising from failure to perform for a six month period. So we wanted to hold the position, hold the line while we studied more closely what we could do. The first thing we came up with was what we call the rental relief framework. Uh, rental relief, rent being probably the single largest cost component besides labor. Uh, labor, we had other programs to help uh, businesses, but for, for rental, it was a private arrangement between landlord and tenant. 
So we intervene and we impose a sharing arrangement between landlord and tenant. Because when you entered into the lease arrangements, it was on a very different paradigm. It was on the basis that you would have cash flow, business would operate, but now we had to shut down restaurants, clubs, bars, shopping centers. You know, we had to make very direct, deep interventions. So we introduced a system where we could help the tenants and the landlords come to a consensus, come to an arrangement to share that. The second thing we did was to look at how we could manage insolvency. And, and we were worried that many companies, many businesses, including the small micro businesses, once you went into bankruptcy, not just, it will not just be seen as a business failure as a result of COVID, but there could be a personal stigma that could be attached to the individuals behind those businesses. So we wanted to make sure that people don't suffer as a consequence of that or suffer disproportionately as a result of what happened. So we introduced a process where, again, there was a hiatus or a moratorium on bankruptcy. There was also a way in which we could simplify restructuring. So for small companies that really had a fundamentally strong business model, but you just had no cash flow, we made sure that you could restructure the businesses easily. And the third um, thing we did a couple of months later was um, something which interfered with the sanctity of contract. We allowed parties who entered into a contract during pre-COVID to then enter into a renegotiation post-COVID. So if you have a bargain a supply contract, for example, from somewhere in Europe, supply chains were shut down or you know, the prices went up five times, ten times, the whole bargain has changed. The whole paradigm of that bargain has changed. It allowed parties to come together. We set up a body which would, which would in the first instance, try and find mediation, try and find common ground, failing which there will be an administrative tribunal stepping in to make decisions on the basis of equity, fairness. And we thought that was important. You know, it was, uh, we spent some time internally in the cabinet thinking about whether we should take this step because it's quite a big step to interfere with private contracts. But at the same time, we also realized that, you know, much of this would end up in the courts as force majeure or, you know, or a breach of contract, and you end up with a lot of disagreement over this period of time, and it's just not productive. So we thought this system was better, and we set up a series of laws that dealt with this. And uh, which is one last final point on this. We felt that it was these pieces of legislation were key in taking us back. You know, when if you compare our economy in, say, second quarter 2020 versus a year later, it's, it's made substantial improvement. The number of bankruptcies and liquidations were by and large maintained, if not came down slightly. So we, we felt that there was, these were all important steps to help the economy come back, protect livelihoods in as much as it is important to protect lives, businesses, business failures could also impact someone adversely. So these were all measures that we took in the middle of COVID. Thank you. That was very illuminating. And, and uh, I think what is most interesting is the fact that you actually intervened legislatively to have a moratorium on termination of contracts for breach. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and renegotiation. I think that's, that's, that's a very far-reaching, uh, that, that's, that's good thinking, actually. And it probably was required at that time. Uh, it, it was not necessarily the easiest thing to do. And I think no. a lot of parties, a lot of landlords, for instance, were very upset because, you know, they had rents, they you know, entitled to collect rental, and here we are telling them, you've got to come down, in fact, share the pain with the tenants. And in the end, I think, by and large, most were persuaded that we are in this for the longer term. And if, if the tenant is unable to pay because of a lack of cash flow, because his business has been shut down, and you take this person to court, there's not much more that you can get. So in the end, I think the business community, because we had many dialogues with them, engaged with them, understood that this was overall for the better good. As an offshoot, uh, and, and many, many countries and systems have, have uh, enjoyed this benefit, a silver lining to all of this was the fact that businesses and professions had to function virtually. Uh, and I think more and more people became aware of the advantages of technology and how it could be uh, utilized and exploited to meet such challenges. Do you think that these aspects will remain with us even in the future? I think there's no doubt about that, right? I mean. Look, I remember that uh, pre-COVID, we made a big push, to, our judiciary in Singapore made a big push to put ourselves on you know, computer, computer systems and we had, you know, every, every council's table had elaborate computer desks, uh, computer, uh, computers and 
screens and so on. And I remember that when I, first thing we'll do when we get to court, and I think the vendor will probably remember that, is we'll take the nice, big, elaborate screen, put it down, and use it as a shelf for our papers. And uh, so that continued. So it was not easy to, to, to persuade the uh, lawyers to move onto technology. But once there was a need to, and once we could not otherwise communicate or do hearings, I think it moved very quickly. So I think this will be here to stay. Although I would sound a word of caution on, on its over-reliance, because just as the, the winner said just now in, in his opening speech, uh, which was a very good speech, Davi, I, I think in as much as it's important to exchange thought leadership and learning, which we can do quite effectively online, I think what's important for our industry as lawyers, fellow lawyers, is the social element, being able to see each other face to face, share a coffee, have a drink, and chat about latest developments and build contacts. And that's also important in the context of mentoring younger lawyers. I, I remember that when I was a young lawyer, one of the most important lessons that I learned from my senior, senior counsel at that point in time uh, was in the cab on the way to, to court or sitting outside chambers waiting for your turn at hearings. So whilst we can use technology, and I'm sure we will, it'll be here to stay, I think it is equally important to ensure that we don't let it replace the human interface, which I think is import extremely important for us as fellow members of the bar. You're, you're absolutely right. You shouldn't let technology become a master. It's really only a tool. Uh, and you make a valid point about uh, what happened to juniors, not only in the legal profession, but in businesses and professions, that, that magical learning uh, by seeing things in action was suddenly cut off for them. And, and they spent two years outside the system, though they could peer into it through a screen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even for hearings, I remember occasions when I was a young lawyer, you finish your hearing and after when, you, when you're done with the orders, the judge will sit down and have a chat with both counsel. And I think those are all important learning points which you don't get on a Zoom hearing. You turn on the Zoom hearing and it, you know, the proceedings start and they end when you click end and that's it. And so there isn't that personal interaction. I think that's something that we will miss if we keep relying on technology alone. And certainly Singapore gives you uh, one of the greatest places in the world for that kind of interaction because you've got, diff you've got mediation centers, of course, SEAC, and you've got your international commercial court. Uh, which brings me to the sort of next uh, set of questions I have for you. Singapore is, has been in the vanguard now of promoting mediation. Uh, do you think that increasing global tendency towards mediation will have an adverse effect on the use of arbitration as a tool to resolve commercial disputes, or do you think that the two are complementary? I, I think in many ways it is complementary. I mean, after all, when you think about it from the perspective of the user, uh, what does a user want to do? The user wants to resolve his or her dispute. It's a legal dispute. And the best way of resolving the dispute or rather, the way in which it's best resolved to protect and preserve the business and my own objectives will be the best way. So it's important for us to not see the two or three modalities of dispute resolution as being competitive with each other, but I think they can play a hugely complementary role. And I think we heard Judge say earlier that increasingly people favor up met or met up provisions and at breakfast today, Lawrence from SICC was telling me that there's now lit met as well. Litigation, mediation, litigate, lit met up, he was saying. So, I, so any combination of this would be useful. And I think if you look at this from the perspective of the user, I think it's a great thing that there's a, long, a wider array of options available for parties to resolve their disputes, choose a way. And, and, and as Judge also said, mediation allows us tools which can be done extra legally. So you don't have to be bound by legal principles. The measure of damages, for example, can go beyond what we believe to be the correct thing in law. And very innovative solutions can be found. And you're right, because the institutionalization of mediation as a mechanism is so important, because uh, I'm sure you had this experience in Singapore as well. There was always the odd judge who would favor mediation. But that was a personal initiative. That wasn't part of the system. So it's very important to have made it part of the system. Uh, it's it's yeah. something that, I mean, as a, as a, even as a young Singapore lawyer yeah. many decades ago now, I, I, we grew up with. Because 
one of the things the judge would ask, you know, particularly in chambers, is, you know, have the parties found common ground? Have you talked about this? You know, and I think in, sometimes you get a nudge or two from the, from the bench, which has always been useful. And for us in Singapore, it's been very much a part of the thinking, even in litigation, yeah. even in court disputes. So, I mean, to take for example, uh, if the parties go to the Court of Appeal, even though a judgment of the first instance has been issued, and the parties, one side has obviously succeeded and the other side has not, in most cases, even before you get into the Court of Appeal hearing, you're asked, have you tried mediation? Can you go for mediation? Even, even in that situation. And we try very hard, even at that stage, to try and persuade our own clients, our parties, to go through that process. Because we see, as counsel, we see the benefit of a successful mediation. Because a successful, media successful outcome in a mediation is probably more valuable than a successful judgment or an award. Because it allows our clients to preserve the ongoing relationship that they might have had with their opposing party. Now, I'm sure you've been asked this quite often, but, but let me ask it for the benefit of the audience. Arbitration in Singapore, particularly SIAC, SIAC was formed only in 1991. That's fairly recent compared to the other institutions, and yet it has had this most remarkable success as an institution. It's today, there was a Queen Mary survey that put it as the second most preferred institution in the world. And we in India can understand that because, uh, as Davinder told you, uh, there's a huge India connect to the SIAC. What did you think Singapore got right in the way it approached arbitration? Because obviously SIAC has succeeded not only because it's a beautifully run institution, but because the government of Singapore gave it that system within which it could grow and flourish. So what are the, what are the pointers to that success? Well, I would say we started with the right ingredients. We were geographically centrally located, English-speaking jurisdiction, and the foundations we share with India, rule of law, transparency, you know, we are guided by the same legal principles. I think that gave us a very strong foundation to start with. And then we built on that and we said we wanted an institution that would be not just Singapore, but really international in every respect. So the best arbitrators on our panel, the best members on the court, uh, the best quality secretariat, fastest, most uh, well uh, published awards and so on. So that was the objective. How we got there was to be quite agnostic about how and who would be on SIAC. And you can see today that SIAC has been built up on the strength of so many prolific luminary arbitrators, lending, it, lending their weight to the quality of the, the panel. And I think that has been our philosophy over the years. Secondly, one thing that we pride ourselves on is the ability to move very quickly and respond to business needs. I mean, after all, uh, people choose arbitration, uh, people have their choices, so they choose arbitration because they see this as the most efficient, most fair way of resolving the disputes. So we have to therefore respond to parties' needs. New ways of, new modalities of hearing. Uh, we talked about, I mean, Judge talked about emergency arbitrators earlier. I think that was an advent that was, that happened a couple of years back in response to industry. We think it's important for us to move quickly and we think we can. So we set up SIAC in 1991. We had the International Arbitration Act some 28 years ago. We have made many changes, many uh, uh, revisions to the Act in the last two decades or so. Some of them are quite substantive, quite substantial ones, uh, changing the whole ethos behind arbitration in response to the mercantile position, the commercial needs. Third, I, I think it's also trying to build the hardware with the software. So we have the physical infrastructure, which of course is important. I mean, arbitrators will choose a venue that they're comfortable with, like to go, and there are also services around it, but also the software and ensuring that within the SIAC and also SIAC as one of the members of the thought leadership ecosystem in Singapore, that we can thrive and coexist. So within SIAC, as I said, the best talent, the best arbitrators, the best possible secretariat. 
the external environment in Singapore is also important, so we encourage thought leaders to be based in Singapore, whether you come from ICC, uh, AAA, WIPO for, uh, for intellectual property disputes, INSOL for insolvency and so on, to ensure that Singapore remains at the centre of thought leadership for dispute resolution. I think that, that puts it very nicely. I, I would sort of, I've always felt three things made Singapore stand out. Uh, one was thought leadership. It's always been at cutting edge, including, for example, emergency arbitration, you rightly said. Uh, it was willing to innovate and try new things which other jurisdictions weren't. Uh, the second is the entire ecosystem uh, that exists in Singapore and a system that has always given confidence, uh, particularly for Indian arbitrants, uh, there's a huge trust factor. And I think uh, Singapore has maintained that trust factor. And the third is what you were saying uh, about getting a lot of things done right. So it reminded me of this uh, French chef, Fernand Poin, who defined perfection as the art of getting several things done right and well. Uh, and I think that's what Singapore has managed to do without losing the big picture. You, you, I mean, you're very kind in your comments. Uh, the, but I, I would say also uh, that um, it takes a whole of the legal industry approach for us. And one of the things that we are fortunate in, in a small country is that between the government and the bench and the bar and also legal academics, you know, there is a lot of consultation, there's a lot of engagement and foreign lawyers as well. And, including users like all of you here, you know, with, uh, as Davinder said earlier, India being a very strong, a very important market for us, uh, great supporters from India, and also lots of the suggestions and the changes that we've made to our framework has come from these kind of dialogues. So we're very keen to have that. Um, ultimately, you know, we know parties have choices. And, you know, much as we have made progress in the last couple of decades since 91, I think it's important to also look to the future and look ahead and see how we can reposition and to change ahead of the curve is, is, where, is what we're aiming for. So, so looking into the future, what do you think are the challenges arbitration will face and in particular arbitration in Singapore will face? I think cost will constantly be one. Speed will be another because we are now looking at courts moving very quickly in, you know, in Singapore. So when we're competing on cost and speed, if you think about it, why would someone want to use arbitration if somewhere can be faster and cheaper? So the quality of the awards has to be tip-top, top-notch. The quality of the administration has got to be strong. And of course, we also have to ensure that party confidentiality, uh, arbitration confidentiality is maintained, which was a recent uh, amendment we made to our laws, by the way along with the fact that we also made changes to the conditional fee agreement. Um, just to digress a little bit, in Singapore, we've always been a little bit chary of introducing conditional fee. Uh, so we have got very strict rules like India has in the past as well on champerty. So we were worried about what that would do. But eventually, after talking to users, talking to arbitrators, counsel from across the world, looking at what other institutions have been doing, development of the law in other jurisdictions. We recently also introduced conditional fee agreements to allow our practitioners, uh, to, uh, our cases, to also pitch on that basis. So to me, it's also about making sure we respond quickly to these challenges and, de and developments. But these are, the, these are the two or three, top two or three challenges that we might see in, in arbitration. The other one on the horizon, of course, is the external competitive factors. As I said earlier, a party can now choose arbitration or you can choose litigation. You can go to the, if you have an international commercial case, you can use the SICC in Singapore. Or you have a whole range of other arbitral institutions to choose from. And ICC has been doing very well in the case management. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have an intellectual property dispute or a technology dispute, you can go to WIPO. So the external environment is also competing very, very strongly with arbitration. And, and so from what you're, you're telling us, it's really that partnership between private institutions and the government of Singapore uh, that seems to be the magic formula. Uh, is it a structured interaction? Is, is there any f formula that you follow? Is there uh, regular interaction or is it, is it more ad hoc and, and reactive? I, 
I would say it's both. I mean, it's both structured and unstructured. Structured in that, you know, we make, we make it a point quite, almost quite religiously that whenever we introduce a new bill in Parliament, new amendments, that we take the views of practitioners, the stakeholders, and we, we, we take a, that's very important for us, that we consult with our stakeholders. I mean, to go back to my example earlier, before we decided to pass the bill in Parliament to introduce changes to rental frameworks between landlords and tenants, we sat down with a whole range of different landlords, big, small ones, medium ones, those in REITs, those operating on their own. We sat down with tenants to understand their perspective, and then we shaped the legislation based on that. And we do the same for arbitration. We talk to council, we talk to arbitrators, we talk to domestic, local practitioners, foreign council, and a range of them to understand and to take soundings before we move. So that's a structured process. But I would say it's also a very unstructured process in the sense that you know, myself, as well as my minister in Ministry of Law, Minister Shanmugam, we are both practitioners from before, spent many years at the bar, and have many people we know from the local bar and external foreign bar as well. And everyone so often, you know, because we are present with lawyers at functions, at events, and, um, you know, we have social connections as well, that helps us to get a very good sounding, a very good sense of what and how the bar is reacting to various things. So, both formal as well as informal, I would say. One of the things that strikes us uh, about Singapore is the international nature of its bar. Singapore is one of those jurisdictions that has always welcomed international lawyers. Uh, is that something that was done consciously or did it just arise uh, on its own? It was quite conscious. I mean, to go back to the point I made earlier about SIAC and being um, indifferent in a way to who could practice arbitration as long as clients had the best choices, best options. So we started SIAC 91, I think a couple of years later. Uh, when we first started, it was you know, Singapore lawyers. A couple of years later, we opened up and foreign lawyers could thereafter practice quite freely arbitration. In fact, if today, I think we are probably at, at the high watermark of foreign lawyers practicing arbitration in Singapore. And we've seen that in a number of firms, chambers that have proliferated in Singapore, practicing arbitration. So it was quite conscious and quite deliberate. Um, I would also give you another example, Darius. It's in the case of uh, SICC, we recently moved an amendment in Parliament to allow foreign lawyers uh -huh. to have rights of audience at the SICC on large-scale cross-border insolvencies and restructurings. On the basis that if you, you know, if today, if you have a large restructuring, there's seldom a, a business today which is, which is large, which is not multi-jurisdiction in nature. And, you know, you oftentimes have ongoing parallel restructurings taking place in different jurisdictions. Some can be in Delaware, London, and other parts of the world, also presence in Singapore. And so allowing that right of audience helps the process, helps the parties, and also helps the court make an assessment more accurately. So we have moved in these areas, whilst at the same time ensuring that domestic practice, domestic laws remain the province of domestic lawyers. So Singapore Qualified Council will still be required to address the... Now, you've seen Indian arbitral institutions uh, evolve, and there are several good ones which we heard about which have, which have been established and which are finding their feet. Uh, Obviously, for many of them, Singapore would be a model to emulate. But do you think that there's any formal role for the Singapore government uh, in, in actually uh, establishing some kinds of interrelationships uh, and mentoring programs for institutions? Well, I, I think these institutions have to develop in tandem with its own local contextual needs in, in India. And so I'm not sure that you know, Singapore should play, at least at the government level, should play any kind of formal role in these institutions. And I think you don't need to because from what I see, you have very established institutions in Delhi, in Mumbai, you have camp coming up, and you have a number of specialist arbitral tribunals taking up the cudgels and really developing very well. And again, we heard Judge say earlier, developments in the last six or seven years, I think I counted three major ones that he's he cited 2015, 17, and was it 18 or 19, right, to be very pro-arbitration, to develop a set of laws that allow for the curial 
support to be given to arbitration to, to favour party autonomy. I think all these developments puts India in a very strong position on its own to develop. That said, I think this kind of informal interaction, social interaction, uh, soundings that we take with stakeholders on both sides, both jurisdictions, making sure that we find consensus in the way in which we structure and organize our rules and uh, developments in arbitration and our practices on both jurisdictions would be useful. So I, I, would, I would like to see this continue. In fact, that's, these sort of interactions help uh, both institutions evolve uh, because I'm sure Singapore would also uh, learn things from how we practice and perhaps introduce those practices because as, as one of the speakers says, how one practices is also very much a product of the culture and the area where you come from. So I think the, the interaction is always very useful. Uh, and, a, and a jurisdiction like Singapore, which is so flexible, uh, is, is, is really a, a great uh, laboratory for that kind of experiment. No, indeed. I, th I think there is much for us to learn from India. I mean, you have m much, much more history. You know, many times our history and the legacy and the heritage of practice has been very strong in India. And, and each time I, I meet a senior advocate, I mean, particularly when I was in practice, each time I meet a senior advocate and learn and listen to his or her cases, I, I find that you know, there are things that you can take away from that. So it's, uh, I would say there's no monopoly over good ideas. You can often exchange these ideas. And I'm very glad that we have an opportunity like today's forum on such an important day to be able to do so. That's great. Let me get back to a, a personal question or two. Uh, how different is it actually being minister of law from being senior counsel? where you were given a brief, you were given a problem, you had to solve it, you had to argue your way through it. Here, as we've heard, you can actually change the law when you want to. Uh, that's a very tough question. I mean, I, 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 I mean, speaking personally, I enjoyed being at the bar. I enjoyed my time at the bar. I mean, you, you go to cases, you know, there'll be days that you come back, you know, and your shoulders are all droopy because you just got a badgering from the court. You know, the judge doesn't see the arguments and, you know, you... Your opponent has just got the better of you in all the arguments, and I'm sure many of you face that as well. There'll be those days. But there'll be other days where you feel energized, you know, you've made a point, you know, it resonated, you know, judgments are written, and you've been in a position as counsel to influence and change the law. I, you know, I think that's what excites all of us as counsel, as, as litigators. So I miss that. I, I enjoyed that. And I also miss the fact that in Singapore, we've got a very strong, very tight bar, uh, lots of friends at the bar, and I still do, I hope. Uh, and and I, I see them as uh, you know, people that I, I count as friends. So it was tough for me to leave the bar in that way. Uh, but as, as you say, Deraz, today we look at it and I can look at it from a broader perspective. And in fact, in many ways, the relationship that I formed at the bar has helped me tremendously in the work that I do in, in understanding practice, understanding perspective, seeing it from the way a lawyer might see it, but also understanding the trade-offs that we have in government in trying to build Singapore as a legal industry with first-class legal industry, a strong legal hub where parties want to come and bring the cases here, and also in a broader context, building our economy and showing that Singapore's economy is open, transparent, welcoming, and able to attract the best of businesses to locate in Singapore. So that, that tension is there, but I feel that there is a lot of synergy in what I do. So I'm afraid I can't give you an answer as to which I would prefer over the other, but I would say that there is much, that, much synergy between the two roles that I've been playing. And in fact, there's synergy all around because this is, regardless of what is happening in the last few years, it's still an area of globalization, uh, global interaction, uh, working together. And I think Singapore has shown us how that can be done, uh, you know, extremely effectively. Thank, thank you. But I think this is something we can do together. I think if you do just look a little bit down crystal ball gazing, crystal ball gazing Asia remains a very strong part of the world economically. The flow of funds coming into this part of the world is not abated despite COVID. Foreign direct investments coming into Asia has been very strong. And the growth trajectory of novel areas of practice, whether it's in cryptocurrency disagreements or disputes, of which much has been in news lately, um, new areas of law and technology, uh, AI, I think all that is exciting. And if, we were law if I was a lawyer today, I'd be looking at these growth areas. And so there's much that we can do together between Singapore and India. And I hope that our bar 
also maintains that relationship between each other because there's much that we can learn from each other. Absolutely. And I have one last question for you, and I'm sorry to ask it. It's a very difficult question. Uh, I believe you're a fan of football. So which team are you supporting for the World Cup? It's clearly not Portugal, because you're also a Man U supporter, I understand. I think being a Man U supporter has made supporting football really difficult in the past 10 years or so. You know, each time I stay up to watch a match, and you know, in India, uh, in Singapore, it's much later than it is in India, you know, I end up falling asleep after 10 minutes. And then when I wake up, you know, we've lost 4-0 to Brentford or something like that. You know, it's just incredible. So what's more exciting, the law or football? I think in recent times, I think law is more exciting. <laughs> but having said that, having said that, you know, in typical football, die-hard football fan fashion, we always say there's always next season. So it's always next season. But in the World Cup, Great. I've traditionally been a fan of the Dutch. I like the way they play, I like the way they come together, exciting, free-flowing football. But I must say that in this World Cup, I am really rooting for the Asian teams. I think they've been exciting, they've, been, they've, they've played you know, uh, out of their skins, and I'm hopeful that one or more of the Asian teams will progress far, and I'll support the Asian teams. Great. So on that very Asia-centric note, thank you, Minister Tong. Thank, thank you, Doris. Thank you very much, everyone.